we're going to talk a lot. And uh, I had this tendency to uh, uh, over-prepare sometimes, so I apologize. Um, and uh, I want to also thank uh, the gallery, because um, I've, I've been coming here for now probably a couple of years with my students to these Pioneer uh, series talks, and they're always great. It's always fantastic speakers. Um, I'm humbled to be among them now. And um, uh, like last last month, we saw Andy Lipkiss from the Tree People, uh, one of the founder. Well, he was the founder, and now the president. And so this talk was great. And so it's it's uh, definitely humbling to be following in, in his wake. Um, a few things uh, I want to start with. Uh, he's also saying this gallery is amazing. Check out the artwork uh, sometime when you get a chance and um, come back because I've learned a lot. Um, by coming here through through time. Also tonight, I'd like uh, students, this is the one time you're gonna actually get to use your cell phone. Um, uh, in class, I don't allow them to use their cell phones because it usually detracts from the learning process. However, tonight, um, please, if you see something, you wanna Facebook it, you wanna take notes, etc. Uh, you would have thought I, I paid them to be here tonight or gave them extra credit, and this is uh, uh, none of the above. It's actually a part of, um, for the adults who are here. Um, most of these, I, I think pretty much all these students are in my marine biology or biology class at Santa Monica High School. And part of their grade is actually a service learning uh, portion, which is kind of getting students involved with the community. So every semester they have to go to five community events. It can be a public lecture, it can be a beach cleanup, a wetlands you know, uh, adventure, you name it, and uh, a whale watching trip, etc. And uh, they're here. They could have picked a different event, but I don't know. They decided to come to this one. I, don't, I have no idea why. Um, so please, <laughs> if you see something on the screen that you've been curious about, because we're going to cover so much tonight, please take out a picture or camera. I will not be offended. It's not rude. Very open uh, for here tonight. Um, also, please, this material is, is obviously very touchy for some people because it's politically charged. The science of climate change and plastic pollution has uh, been fiercely debated. Uh, uh, resolutions and consensuses uh, have, uh, have been made. And I'm here as a scientist, um, and that's my previous background. That's my trade. I'm a scientist, so I'm speaking on behalf of the scientific community tonight, also as an educator at, at Santa Monica High and Santa Monica um, College. Um, let's, let's get started. All right, here we go. So um, the, talk, the title of my talk is uh, Educational Solutions um, to Environmental Woes, uh, The Roles of Students and Teachers in Saving the Planet. And if I could give it another title, we're going to talk a lot about what's plaguing the planet. Uh, at other speeches that you go to that are based on the environment, you might learn a lot about the solutions. I want to make sure that we're all calibrated with what's happening uh, to our planet. And uh, hopefully that will provide us impetus to take measures to uh, move towards solutions, uh, sustainable solutions. Um, this is what my classroom used to look like. Uh, due to fire, fire code, we actually, uh, uh, yesterday, Team Marine, uh, which is an environmental eco-action team that's here with me tonight, um, they actually helped remove uh, most of the adornments in my classroom because uh, it violated fire code. And uh, so it's looked like that for six years, though. So I, I like to remember it like that and we'll, we'll move forward. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you guys tonight is a little bit about my, my personal journey. And, and that obviously includes a lot to do with my students. Uh, what the science says about all these issues. Hurdles to progress. Um, what's keeping us from going toward alternative energies and, and um, using reusable products and, and doing the right thing for, for nature? Um, <coughs> Then I'll, I'll hopefully um, provide some solutions through environmental education, what's been working um, with my students um, at the high school and the college, and then provide a roadmap uh, of where environmental education can go and what we need to do with environmental education, because it's going to play a big role in getting us on the right uh, path uh, and in, involved in a great economy. And of course, uh, my parting uh, thoughts. Uh, so my journey, uh, this is me, I, I'm a surfer, I, I grew up here in Los Angeles, fishing and surfing along our coast, um, learned to dive when I was uh, 18, been playing soccer since I was the age of five, catching sharks and fish, and, and then of course a big portion 
most recently uh, for the last eight years has been educating my, my students um, about marine fauna and flora, especially ones that live here locally. Um, I, uh, by the way, I went to UC Santa Barbara. I also uh, attended the University of Queensland, Brisbane, Australia, where I did my graduate research. And then I did my teaching credential at Cal, uh, Cal State University of Northridge. Um, go to the Australia side. I went to Australia and I lived there for actually four years of my life. I did six months study abroad while I was in college and it was beautiful. I visited this island and I fell in love with it. I got to dive amongst the most beautiful coral reefs and fishes and sharks in the world. <coughs> My research area was actually right up over here, so I'd wake up in the cabins, my research cabins, and just come out on the beach and, you know, go snorkeling with dolphins and, and uh, sharks sometimes, and it's a big thing, so it was very fun. Um, beautiful ship that, that uh, got beached there. Uh, beautiful sunsets and the sunrises were magnificent. This is my friend. Uh, when I lived there for months at a time, uh, I called him Wilson, kind of after the casting. <laughs> I also became uh, an avid underwater photographer, uh, well I should say an amateur, I, I didn't have any big devices but I got lucky once in a while and uh, I have some great footage of that at, at, for a different talk. Um, then I got back from Australia. <laughs> That's what I looked like when I got back from Australia. I was uh, ready to go, I was, I was, I was geared up uh, with a little bit longer hair and maybe a little more youthful. I started a website, Samuel High Marine Bio. Uh, which you guys can visit and, and find teacher resources. If, anyone teachers here, by the way? Anyone teachers? Woo, kind right, of sort of. Very good. Yeah, all right. I see uh, our president uh, of the Board of Education here, uh, Ben Allen, is here. So thank you, Ben. Um, uh, I got out and I, I started teaching students what I had learned as, as um, uh, a student of, of Ray Millet, who was my marine biology teacher. Ray, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand. Uh, he was my marine biology teacher in high school. At, some of the things that he did with me uh, and that I learned in Australia, I started doing with my students, which was a fantastic thing. We, we got out there, got our feet wet, got our hands dirty, uh, doing all sorts of labs, looking at macroalgae and fish and squid and dissecting things. Uh, sorry if you haven't eaten yet, and sorry if you have eaten already. Uh, we dissect, we, we examine things internally, externally, and, and I try to give my students a well-rounded uh, you know, understanding of, of the marine world. <clears throat> Going on field trips to the Vital Wetlands, uh, going to aquaria of different sorts, doing research in the field, uh, learning the real techniques that scientists learn, using the real equipment that scientists use, uh, studying the intertidal zone, all the life that lives there. Um, I got to go diving before I learned it was a liability with my students. I actually went uh, on a summer dive with a few students, which was really fun, and uh, got to experience Deer Creek just north of Malibu. And, uh, since then, I've been back many times. It's a fantastic shore dive. The Kelvin Forest is right there, and there's a diverse invertebrate uh, life there, which is great. In the classroom, we, we study, uh, it's a little harder to study the underwater world, but uh, we do our best with great pictures, learning about the taxonomy of, of different things. Um, these are the ones we'll be learning very soon now that we're going to be fishing up uh, plants and macroalgae. Also, diving into the deep sea in the classroom is also hard, but we, we learn about all this this great phenomena from bioluminescence to giganticism and uh, frilled sharks and dumbo octopuses. So then my, my first year at Santa Monica High School, uh, I had some students who were interested in, and we heard about this quick science challenge, an environmental science competition put on, put on by USC and um, Quicksilver Foundation. And uh, I nicknamed them the guinea pigs because this was the first year we'd ever done an environmental science competition. And, I, uh, I was really happy with them. We, they made their own shirts with actually dyes. Now we have like, you know, custom shirts with the, you know, organic cotton and everything. But we did it right back then. We did a pretty good job. And their job was to pick among many different kinds of uh, human impacts to the planet and do a project on it and then report their project back uh, to USC and, and Quicksilver. So um, one thing that we all ins instinctively went to, and we were like plastics, because all of us, you know, uh, go down to the beach, most of us, in the beach, and we saw, so we selected plastics. And in um, coming years, we would soon learn that plastics actually are made from oil and, and uh, natural gases. And so uh, we started following other things, which I had um, found a good foundation for in Australia, including global warming and, and our, our world's addiction to oil. And of course, the other carbon problem, which is ocean acidification, when the carbon dioxide is going into the water. 
So those have been our three focal issues um, for the last uh, seven years that I've been doing um, this at Santa Monica High. And um, some people track hurricanes. Um, does anyone recognize this, this tornado? Sorry, it's a tornado. Some people track tornadoes. Um, anyone recognize this? Missouri? Um, was it the uh, Jop Joplin? Yeah. Um, some people track uh, tornadoes. Uh, my students and I track trash. And we've been documenting the, the, the spillage of trash um, and the storm drain transport of trash, specifically um, out of the Pico Kenner storm drain for the last uh, five years. I think this year is our fifth year doing it. And it's amazing what can come out of one, you know, uh, not so big storm drain in, in such a short amount of time. Uh, we'll be looking at that later. But this is what it looks like. This is Santa Monica, uh, where Pico Boulevard ends. And this is known as the first flush. And the first flush is when all the storm drain water has flushed out all the plastics out of the storm drain onto the beach. And you have to be there. You have to time it right, because it takes a certain amount of rain. And it can happen any time within a 24-hour period. This year, for instance, it happened at 4 o'clock in the morning. And who was there? I was. <laughs> um, other days, uh, I go surfing, of course, a lot. And I I see lots of plastics on the beach and I collect them. This is between two lifeguard stations. Um, other days, not looking so pretty. These are not just winter days, guys. These are, notice the track of time here. It's in a span of time. Um, my students and I find a sea urchin during our dive, um, living in a lunchable, a plastic lunchable. Um, I, I got known as being the person who squirted plastic in from the water in his wetsuit and had to make, you know, tumors and things growing out. People wondered about that. Jellyfish balloons, plastic bags under storm drains, uh, single-use uh, you know, plastic water bottles, Starbucks cups, uh, styrofoam containers. My students going out, you can see the kind of the timeline here. Uh, trying to pick up what we can, but it's it's usually pretty hard. Uh, this was another, it was a, more of a daytime first flush, which was nice, so my students can see it. Uh, of course, we then went out uh, shortly after, and what was out there, everything from motor oil bottles made out of plastic, cigarette butts, styrofoam containers. Don't feel bad. A lot of us use them. But the reason why we're all here is because we want to improve. We want to get better. And that's why uh, we're going to have this conversation. Uh, so one of the days, I collected plastics in my wetsuit. And I, it was so much plastic that I, I ended up finding a plastic bag in the water. I stuffed it in the bag. And then I floated the bag right next to me in between waves. And then I go back, catch some more plastic, put it in the bag. So then I post it on Facebook, and one of my friends on Facebook said, Ben, this is going to go viral. And I was like, really? Uh, all right. Uh, so that gave me the idea, all right, I'll send it to the press. So I sent it to all of our media contacts, and uh, the next day, actually within hours, I was contacted by KTLA. It was posted on KTLA, and uh, I, I ended up doing a news interview on NBC. Um, this was... Uh, I want to show you guys a little video of what, what this first flush actually looks like. Um, this is going to be one of two short, short videos I have to play. So. Some of you have seen this, sorry, for seconds. But.
this is in the trash. Plastic right here, no matter what it is. Actually, the oil companies don't actually have to disclose uh, what they do. 
uh, in regards to fracking, but fracking is basically putting a big pipe underground, pumping it with water, chemicals, um, and particulates to kind of uh, put pressure on underground areas, and it basically collects natural gas and oil. Uh, it's a way especially to get natural gas. And um, they've just started doing this in the Baldwin Hills area. And of course, everybody who learned about this uh, went to uh, you know, their local representatives and said, this has got to stop. Um, and so then the company, the, the company that we're trying to stop from polluting um, and doing this fracking is the one that actually hired the research scientists to determine whether it was safe or not. That's not sound science. Sound science is, is um, when independent scientists go in and do the research and the homework. So back to the students, uh, a little uplifting moment. The students decided to tackle some of these issues. They were a formidable force for big industry. Um, they learned about these issues uh, through uh, you know, going to events like this one um, and uh, through lectures in class. They got inspired. They told their friends. They formed a rally. And they've been on six marches to get plastic bags banned in Santa Monica. And guess what? They were successful. But it took a while. Now, I don't want to say that we were the only ones working on this issue. There was a whole lot of others who helped us along the way. And, um, but I should say we helped them because we, we came in kind of late in the game. Um, there's some people who, like Mark Gold from Hill to Bay, have been working on these issues for 20 years. So um, those are my heroes. Uh, next thing I know, students are doing these great things for the planet. They're winning awards. I'm on a plane to Cozumel, Mexico. All expenses paid for, a resort hotel on the beach. My friends are, my, my students are in the water floating around like little sea turtles. And we're, we're, we're learning about underwater life on a, on a coral tropical reef environment. Uh, Danny's getting to snorkel for his first time. Um, Yasi is teaching one of the middle schoolers on the trip, you know, how to identify a fish. Um, all of a sudden, the next day, we're in 150 newspaper articles across the United States, um, which was like crazy. How did this all happen so fast? We're being uh, camera crews are coming into our classroom. Uh, Nick Cannon is hanging out with Megan. Whole Foods is with us. NBC comes into the classroom. Um, filming with CBS outside of the school. Uh, KTLA is there. Uh, Eco Company Television. Megan, all of a sudden, I, unbeknownst to me uh, and unknowingly, I, I nominated her for this HALO Award. Uh, stands for Helping and Leading Others. And she's then, um, this red carpet's being rolled down uh, on, on the sand. Uh, Nick Cannon comes up the beach in a tuxedo and high, uh, shiny high tops. And a, a titanium uh, podium is put in the sand. And Nick Cannon brings out two $10,000 checks for our uh, eco hero, Megan Kilroy. So we got, that was a good beach cleanup, by the way. Then I'm teaching in the classroom. Meanwhile, Megan's hanging out with Mariah Carey and Nick Cannon at some party <laughs> with her you know, bottle cap dress. I got to go to this one, though. This was fun. We got to go down and hang out with the Lakers at halftime, and, and that was really cool. I, I realized how small I really am. <laughs> Next thing we know, I, I, I was in uh, uh, Sacramento with my students. We went up there. And they wanted to give us this award, and little did we know that uh, Senator Frank Pavley would be giving us an award, and uh, it's called the Ocean Hero Award, and it was uh, a really big honor, probably the biggest honor I've, I've ever received from the state, um, and the students too. Next, uh, yeah, a few days after that, we're, we're now hanging out with Bill Nye, the science guy. He's a very interesting fellow, and uh, yeah, but that was very fun, uh, winning uh, first place in the Edison Challenge put on by Southern California Edison and USC. One of my favorite people, Jane Goodall, she's, uh, she's a really special person and has done a lot for this planet. And she always has a positive outlook. And, and I, I have to say that I've learned a lot from her. And, and um, she, she knows us personally, and, and she's going to be coming and spending some personal time with us in the classroom. So. Full rides to Harvard, Ocean Hero Awards, all sorts of great stuff happen. Students uh, doing better on tests in the classroom, connecting real world with the curriculum, and that's what it's been all about. Uh, a really fantasy for you know, a school teacher. One of the best things about it is the students are plugging into their community. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever worked with any of these groups, but these are our, our partners, people we worked on different campaigns with, we've done science research with, um, and really, really great groups that I, I, I've grown to love. So what does the science say? How are we doing on time? Good. 
Um, what does the science say? Well, the science says, uh, you know, uh, we have some problems, Houston. And so, um, plastic pollution, uh, you know, this is 317 pieces of plastic taken out of a sea turtle stomach. Um, this is one of the scariest things that's right at uh, the, the tip of the research right now. This is exactly what, you know, Scripps and, and Woods Hole, um, groups like Algolita Marine Research Foundation, Five Jars Institute, they're all researching this right now. And what this is, is these are plastic nurdles, and plastic nurdles actually are the pre-production pellets for making all plastic things. So the chairs that you're sitting in used to be these little baby nurdles. And there's a saying, nurdles kill, kill turtles. And these little plastic pellets right here, um, over time in the ocean, they actually have an affinity and, and, and um, absorb uh, these persistent organic loops, they're called POPs. And POPs are things like um, this right here, this is DDT and uh, other polybrominated uh, uh, compounds and, and including P, uh, PCBs um, and PBDEs. Um, these are things that have an affinity to oil because um, they're hydrophobic, they're hydrocarbons, and oil is also hydrocarbons, so they stick to plastic like a sponge. And the problem is these pellets are so small and we've been so irresponsible with these pellets and of course all the other plastic fragments that are out in the ocean that they're, they're, uh, the toxins are absorbing onto the surface and marine life, uh, including these uh, lanternfish from the family Mectophidae, are swallowing them. Uh, the chemicals then, uh, what we think is happening, is desorbing off of the plastics into the fish's tissues uh, then, of course, there's some scientists who are doing the research and actually determining that very thing right now. That's exactly where the research is right now. And I will have a punchline from this lady right now. I just saw her speak the other day, um, uh, Rochman. She, she's doing, or maybe Rochman, um, but her name is Chelsea. Chelsea's doing some fantastic work in toxicology. Um, she'll be among probably the first of 20, 30 scientists working on this very issue right now. Is there bioaccumulation? Of uh, these toxins up the food chain and then biomagnification to higher and higher species. And who's at the top? Yeah. Of course, plastics are not uh, innocent creatures either. Inside plastics, we have a range of different chemicals uh, which can leach out of plastics. We know this, there's thousands of published studies now on plastics and the ability of uh, EPAs, phthalates, and other toxic chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals and uh, known and suspected carcinogens leaching out of plastic. These things, uh, you know, the minute I heard smaller penis size in lab rats, that's, that will make any man just not want to drink out of a plastic water bottle ever again. Um, and of course, there's all these other things. Uh, everybody knows there's been you know, a, a lot of autism and AD, ADHD, um, early puberty, thyroid uh, dysfunction, hypo and hyperthyroidism. These are all being uh, linked to plastic chemicals that are leaching out of the products into our beverages and our foods. This is a, a famous article now in the Time Magazine, The Perils of Plastic, it's great. Um, <clears throat> we're also washing our face with it. And inside these scrubs, um, we have these little microscopic beads of plastic and they're abrasive, they work great. Um, they, they take out some of the things, but they're also going down our sinks and into the ocean, into our waterways. And one of our friends at, at Five Gyres, um, Marcus Erickson and Anna Cummins, two of my, my local heroes, um, they actually gave uh, Abe Lincoln a, a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, some dreadlocks with plastic little microbeads. Um, these are two companies right here that are using polyethylene, okay, um, which is a, a, a type of plastic, and that's in washing down the sink. These other companies are using natural alternatives. So that's uh, another. That's a, a war that's being waged between the environmental community and some of the face washing, um, uh, cleansing companies. Plastics all around us. Plastic is uh, we've got tea bags of plastic. My money used to be in paper. Now it's plastic. Our vegetables and fruits are packed in plastic. Tea lights in plastic. By the way, this is this is pretty interesting right here. Um, we generate so much plastic. We produce so much. But look at this green line. This is how much we recover or recycle, okay? We're not doing a very good job at recovering the packaging and, and all the materials. 
And it gets confusing. Is anyone confused on what can be recycled and what not? I've been doing it for eight years, and I still get recycled. Will Santa Monica accept this or not? It's just, it's a nightmare, and we need to simplify the system. Of course, there are five major ocean gyres. They spin clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. And all five of them have been visited by Five Gyres Institute, and all five of them have copious amounts of plastic. We're not talking about a trash island here. It's not an island. It's just a confetti, a sprinkling of plastic throughout the water. Um, this is the guy who dis discovered the, um, the what's known as the Eastern Pacific Garbage Patch. His name is um, uh, Charlie Moore, Captain Charlie Moore. Uh, he's, he's now a friend of mine at Big Storm Marcus and Anna. And they've now gone on and carried on um, Charlie's work. Charlie's still very active with the Alameda Marine Research Foundation. Anna and Marcus are, you know, they jump on every boat they can get to tow a manta trawl behind a boat, collect the plastic, quantify it, so that we can understand the problem a little bit better. Plastics are made from oil. So 8% uh, of our world oil production is used to make plastics. You might be thinking, well, that's only 8%. Um, that's a lot, guys. 8% uh, is a big chunk. And so the plastic problem is also a oil problem. We've also got, of course, global warming. Uh, students, do you guys remember the name of this famous curve? Um, yeah, the Keeling curve, that's right. The Keeling curve was um, uh, Dr. Keeling who made this, basically set up these air balloons, trapped carbon dioxide. Um, for many, many years, we, we didn't go above 300 parts per million um, uh, carbon dioxide concentration. Now we're at 393. Uh, with the projections of, of ending up at about uh, 640 parts per uh, million by 2050, and possibly as high as 1,250 parts per million carbon dioxide by 2100. We all know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It traps um, the radiant heat from the Earth. Just to give you guys, you guys have seen this from Al Gore a million times, and inconvenient truth. Uh, historical levels of carbon dioxide uh, have never gone past 300 parts per million. Some of you may be familiar with the organization 350.org. Are you guys familiar with 350? Well, that's what scientists say would be a good place to stop. You can keep the carbon dioxide at 350 ppm. But we're already at 393, and uh, there's no end in sight right now. This is a uh, a very, very famous graph that, that came out um, not too long ago. It's, it's called the hockey stick graph. You guys see this hockey stick graph? It shows the temperature of our planet and what's been going on with the temperature. Well, the temperature uh, for about 900 years was cooling just a little bit. And then starting in the, in the time of the Industrial uh, Revolution, um, the temperature on our planet uh, started going up. And since then, it has been exponentially uh, increasing. And so hence, you guys see the hockey stick. As soon as this graph was um, produced by Michael Mann, he was getting letters in the mail with white powder in it. He was a very famous uh, scientist um, and uh, probably one of the most prestigious scientists working on climate change. It was an anthrax threat. His family members um, got death threats. Scientists. In his, in his quarters and, and members of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change were getting death threats. Family members of, it were getting, uh, of theirs were getting death threats. Another thing that's been increasing besides CO2 and temperature is world population. And it's interesting that in 1800 we had 1 billion people on this planet and now uh, later uh, we're now at uh, 7 billion. And projections for 2054 uh, we are going to be at 9 billion. And then 2100, as high as 15 billion people. Unless our population takes off, which a lot of scientists like, very famous scientists like James Lovelock, who discovered the ozone hole and, and developed things um, for the microwave, etc. One of the most prestigious scientists on our planet, very prolific writer and, and um, producer of publications. He thinks that we're going to actually get, our population is going to start diving around mid-century. Mid -century. Um, or actually even sooner than that. He said, I think 2040, that we're going to go to a population reduction probably by the end, of, I think he said the end of this century by 80%. That's another way that we could check out. That's in your lifetime. Um, of course, uh, what's the source of all the CO2? I think, I think we know. 
uh, America, as, as said by George, George Bush, we are addicted to oil. And uh, we have an addiction. Um, our cars are 30% bigger than the ones in Europe. Um, not only are we uh, burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, we're also burning forests. So about 16% of our carbon footprint is actually burning uh, forest and, and land use changes. Um, this is what our, our carbon um, portfolio looks like, our carbon emission portfolio looks like in California. Look at transportation, everybody. In California, we're very spread out. We haven't built up like New York. We're building water. It's like the urban sprawl. And as a result, we need transportation. But um, the people who came before us, um, they, didn't, they didn't unfortunately have the, the foresight to create a great public transport system. And so we're relying on our cars. Don't feel guilty for driving a car. But maybe you can do what I did. I bought an electric one. I started to put my money where my mouth is. And I did it. And it got me to this venue tonight. And it didn't break down. And it's not small. It's quiet. It's beautiful. You can have a conversation in the car with your neighbor and loved one and actually hear them without this boom, 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 boom. But we've kind of been addicted to bigger, better, you know, uh, huge, faster, powerful. All of these things that uh, the media and, and advertising kind of convince us that we need. I don't really need all that stuff. I love my electric car. It gets me around plenty good. Um, this is the business as usual. This is the dire prediction. Uh, if we continue emitting carbon dioxide uh, and some other gases like methane, we are going to have our, we're going to follow this trajectory of carbon dioxide emissions. That would lead to about a six degree uh, Celsius increase in global temperature. Right now we are headed on this curve. We are moving along this red line with no end in sight. Sea ice melting, I think you guys probably know the story of that one. Um, Greenland uh, losing ice mass. Uh, sea ice, by the way, going back a second. Do you guys know what sea ice is? Sea ice is ice that's floating in water. Uh, and that's been going down. And you know, one year you might say, oh, well, the sea ice, well, look, we have record sea ice. We're not having global warming. We're not having climate change. But that's just one year. And I've taught my students, you have to look at decades of data to get an idea of what's going on with the planet. Don't just single out a single year. Uh, same thing with uh, glacial ice, which is on land. Uh, Greenland, here is a, by the way, these slides are from NASA. I can make these up. These are pretty cool graphs. Um, this is uh, showing Greenland's uh, losing mass of ice. And what scientists are really worried about right now is these, these dips, these positive feedback loops, where a little melting leads to even more melting. And I could go on and on about that for a while, but. We're seeing accelerating leaps, okay, uh, toward further melting. If Greenland were to melt uh, completely, uh, it would raise sea level 23 feet. Is it going to do it in our lifetime? Likely not. Uh, most scientists say that it will probably take a few centuries to get that amount of water not completely melted. But the predictions are uncertain uh, of how much Greenland can melt because of these what we call positive feedback loops. And um, I'd love to go on about that, but we need to, we need to go on. So far, uh, as a result of melting glacial ice from Antarctica and uh, in the Arctic, like places like Greenland, we've risen sea levels by eight inches. You might be saying, well, that's only this much. Well, uh, that's a lot. And um, projections at the current rate of warming and melting uh, by our best computer models, by the smartest people on this planet, uh, we are looking at between a two to six foot increase in sea level rise um, by the end of the century, by 2100. Two to six feet. Two feet would be catastrophic for Venice, even Santa Monica, New York, remember Sandy? Whew. You completely wipe out Manhattan. What's happening with sea level, guys, um, is that it's not just going up, but as we get greater in time, we see these patterns. Look at this. Uh, the first line showed, uh, you know, from the Industrial Revolution to the 1920s, the Great Depression. Uh, we started doing some more agricultural work and, and doing other things and burning a lot more fossil fuels. You guys see what's happening to the slope of this line? Uh, we're now at about a melting rate of about, uh, or sorry, an increase in sea level rise by about 3.5 millimeters per year. It's only a new bit, but that's going to get up to, you know, uh, you know, five. Uh, millimeters, and then eventually a centimeter, and then we're going to start worrying uh, quite a bit. 
This was in my birthday year. Uh, this is what the sea ice looked like, our, our polar ice cap, right? Uh, in 1979. 30 years later, bam, you guys see that? I like doing it, it's kind of fun. Okay. Uh, it's a lot of melting. See, you guys know the polar bear? Polar bear was the first species to put on the, um, the threat list because of climate change. It's kind of the poster child of, of climate change, I have to include it. But it's sea ice is melting, so it's, it's having to travel further. It's getting fatigued. They're dying of fatigue. Um, and they can't gain access to their feeding grounds as easily as they used to because there's not enough ice to get out to their feeding grounds. So a lot of them are uh, malnourished, and uh, many of them are dying. Coral bleaching. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Australia. I went to UNESCO. I went to probably 30 conferences on coral reefs. Heard from, again, the brightest people on our planet working in you know, talking about derivatives and you know algorithms, and stuff. I couldn't understand anything they were talking about, to be honest. But I got the base of what they were saying, which is when when the water temperature heats up, there's a breakdown between the symbiotic relationship between algae and the host coral. These little algae live inside the coral. They make the sugar for the coral host. The coral host provides a home for the algae, and when it warms up, there's a breakdown in the symbiotic relationship. So my students have been learning about coral bleaching, um, and also because we're adding so many nutrients to the ocean at the same time, uh, the corals, when they bleach and they die, and what's left is a white coral calcium carbonate skeleton, it gets overtaken by algae. So we're seeing these major phase shifts in the ocean from coral-dominated reefs to algal-dominated reefs. Um, I won't bore you with the st stats, but just recently in the news, 50% loss in coral cover for the Great Barrier Reef. Go to the Great Barrier Reef now, ladies and gentlemen. Did you guys hear me? Go now if you've never been. Because it's not going to be there in 10, 20 years. Uh, we may see complete wipeout uh, by the end of this century. The other carbon problem is ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is when carbon dioxide goes into the water and it creates this weak acid called carbonic acid. And that's dissolving shells of plankton. Um, pteropod, which is a staple zooplankton uh, member in the ocean. And it's also causing corals to not be able to grow uh, as successfully because they can't um, calcify uh, as readily uh, under these acidic conditions. Our oceans have become 30% more acidic since the Industrial Revolution. 30%. Um, and of course the projections don't look good. What is this? Uh, again, this is what the research says. This is what uh, Tropical Storm Irene, um, 2011, <coughs> damaged $15 billion. We just had Hurricane Sandy. New Jersey alone, on the national news the other night, $29 billion requested from the state of New Jersey. That's just New Jersey, right? What the scientists, what's, what my science textbook says is that we better start investing in a clean alternative future it's going to cost us about 1% to 3% of our global economy, okay, in terms of investment. But if we don't put in that 1% to 3% of all of our, basically, in, in taxes and et cetera, our incomes, then we're going to be facing a 5 to 20% climate tax every year uh, through the rest of time. Irreversible. This is New Jersey. It's kind of like solar panels. If you buy them, guess what? They pay off in the what? In the long term. So we need to start looking at long term, not just live in the short term. New Jersey Shore, this is now a famous uh, roller coaster that, that was on the pier that got knocked off. They're going to leave it here, apparently, uh, because they want it to bring uh, people like to take photographs of it. It's a roller coaster in the shallows. So come to New Jersey. Um, helping actually the tourism, getting it back, so I, I think it's great. It's also provided structure for little muscles and things to grow on, so it's an artificial reef as well. Um, the new normal, finally, Brian Williams and news, they're actually using climate change, and governors and, and Republicans and Democrats alike are saying, hey, maybe there is something going on here. Droughts, fires, records across the United States, 173.8 acres per fire. That's the uh, one of the top, it's, it looks like the, the fifth largest uh, fire size on average uh, since 2000. 
U.S. drought conditions, 2000, uh, July 2012. You guys can see red usually is <coughs> bad. Maroon is like, okay, stab yourself with a spoon. Uh, not exactly, but drought's been really bad. And um, nearly 1,500 counties, 32 states declared disaster areas. Our corn crop experienced a two-thirds uh, reduction uh, this year. Ended up, did your Thanksgiving turkey cost a little more this year? Probably did. Because the corn is used as feed, it's used as to make fuel. Um, other places in the world are experiencing record floods, fires, fires in Russia, fires in Australia, harsh earth um, in many different places uh, around the world, loss of rainforests and grasslands, giving rise to this, this area of what we call desertification. It's a process by which former forests become parched earth because of the severe drought. That's what climate change is. It's floods in some areas, and it's droughts in others. That's why they, you know, uh, climate extremes. The other problem we have right now, I'm going to have to speed through this a little bit, is a problem with inputting nutrients into the ocean. And when we put nutrients in, like fertilizers and leaky septic tanks leach stuff in, we're getting other problems like eutrophication. The fertilizers go in, the algae bloom, sometimes harmful algae bloom, and we get toxins in the water that can go through the food chain. But the algae bloom, and then upon decomposition of the algae, the bacteria take up all the oxygen out of the water, and it's left with a hypoxic, or even worse, an anoxic environment that's low and no oxygen environment. And um, we now have 400, and, as a result, 405 Actually, it's over that now because this is old data. It's closer to 500 dead zones across the world right now. That's low oxygen areas. One of the biggest ones is at the mouth of the Mississippi River, where a lot of our excess nutrients, and especially nitrogen, is flowing. Burning fossil fuels, guess what? That produces nitrous oxides. Um, and that uh, then rains down into the ocean uh, in the form of uh, certain nitrogen acids. And so we're actually putting reactive nitrogen into the water by burning fossil fuels. You see how these things are connected? Plastics, climate change, oceans, all these things are connected to the central evil, which is what? What's at the root of all these things? We're using fossil fuels. This is a, what we call a massive fish kill. Uh, this was in Galveston, Texas. These are shad. This is what a massive fish kill looks like uh, from a, a dead zone, an ocean dead zone. Everything dies, unless it gets to the water. The other big thing, not only are we putting everything we don't want into the ocean, we're taking everything out that we do want, which is changing the entire ecology of the ocean. This is a great uh, little cartoon. I think it's self-explanatory. Uh, I'm a fisherman as well, uh, and I happily allow the marine protected areas to be implemented in Southern California. I, in fact, my students and I lobbied for it, and I'm a fisherman because I notice trends in my own catch here in the Santa Monica Bay. Sand bats, down. Calico bats, down. Halibut, down. Barred perch, down. Even smaller fish like perch and corbina, down. Our nets are big. They're too efficient. We've got these humongous nets. We've lost 90% of the big game fish. And all of our fisheries, and this is a really striking, 14 marine biologists did this study. By 2050, we're supposed to lose all of our fishing stocks. That's all of our fisheries. All of them will be gone. Except for, of course, humans are pretty good at, at adapting. So we're putting in all these artificial uh, aquaculture you know, nets and things out in the open ocean and on land. Uh, so everything, the sushi of the future, you will be eating uh, what's the best farm catch you can get in the sushi bar. Okay. That's the reality of where we're headed. And this is not, these are the brightest people with the best computer models, with the best statistics working on these things. Okay? Um, long line fishing, all sorts of devastating um, ways of fishing is, is truly, truly bad. We've got seine nets, we've got uh, these long lines that are being deployed. There's a great movie called Shark Water that I show my students. But on average, about 25% of all catch is bycatch. You put it on the boat, and then what do you do with it? Everything that you don't want gets thrown overboard. So it's a very wasteful thing, a lot of these fishing practices. Trawl, trawling for fish. 
leaving bottom scars on, on the ocean floor, breaking up coral reefs and seagrass beds, and um, basically eliminating habitat for many species, and doing it at a frequency that doesn't allow for recovery in these areas. These trawl scars can see, be seen from space, uh, extremely devastating method of fishing. Another one, ghost fishing, uh, also these drift nets. You leave out these nets in the ocean, and the idea is that fish swim into them, get tangled up, you then pull in the net, and you get the fish. Uh, but there's so much bycatch associated with them, and fishermen uh, unfortunately lose them during storms. <coughs> fishermen uh, sometimes also discard them improperly, and so they're entangling. This is on the news. You can look uh, at gray whales, our California gray whale. Um, we, they're getting entangled. Sea turtles <coughs> are getting entangled. These nets are, are wrapping around. There's this new, it's almost like a sport now. It's called pegging. And you basically throw a little lasso around a whale and you tow it until it gets tired. Then it slows down. You then unhook it from uh, these ghost nets. And um, <coughs> then the, the cool part of the story is the whale goes free. Hey, it's water, sir. The, um, the whale goes free, and in, in several cases, the whale actually, at first, it freaks out because somebody's chasing you in the boat, right? Then it turns around, <laughs> comes toward the... <laughs> so much to say. The whale returns to the boat and shows a sign of gratitude, which is, which is amazing. There's a connection. They understand, after it's free, what's going on. Um, shark finning, we're, we're losing between um, 27 million to 70 million sharks a year to shark fin. Mainly for this, shark fin soup. It's uh, highly prized in, in Asian ceremonies um, as a status symbol, and, and a lot of Asian cultures think that it's a cure for cancer. There's no scientific evidence to do that. In fact, it's deleterious to your health because it they're the top of the food chain, and they also concentrate mercury. So, denial. When I started in 2006 teaching, I saw this article. I think my mom cut it out for me because she's so good. My mom's here tonight. By the way. She cut it out for me, and, and I read scientists are getting ten thousand um, dollars. So this is hurdles to progress, by the way. We're starting a new section. Scientists are getting ten thousand dollars for every scientific publication. That, is, that goes against the grain of the consensus of climate change. I was like, what? How could that be happening? We're better than that. I learned some more. There's several things going on here. And it's, it's really complicated. Um, but I really liked how this guy put it. He said, it's good, to have, uh, it's good to be skeptical in science. Why is that? It leads to more research in a particular issue. Uh, skepticism is one thing. It's good to be a skeptic. Challenge everybody. Make sure they are doing you know, uh, a good job with their science. But then there's a spectrum, and it goes into contrarianism and denial. And that's when you have this cranky independence of mind as a, a contrarian. And uh, then, of course, that merges with denial, which is like, OK, I don't care what you tell me. I'm not listening. OK, I'm not listening. Oh, la, 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 la. I'm not listening. I don't care what your research says. That's denial. And that's what is happening. Uh, that's what politicians are saying. They're putting white, white out over the scientific uh, statements. Policymakers are doing this too. That are that have been so and so uh, bought out by by big industry. Um, and this was something. Uh, this has happened in the tobacco industry um, when when tobacco was finally found to be you know a, a carcinogen, the smoke from tobacco. Uh, this memo got out uh, from the industry. Doubt is our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. So I feel that we're all really being duped. Um, we hear so many mixed messages about the true science of things, and that's largely generated by propaganda from big oil, which has ties with the big media, which has ties with you know, um, every major corporation, pretty much. Same thing happened with the chlorofluorocarbons, and now with fossil fuels. They are trying to infuse doubt and uncertainty among us. Uh, and this is not just by me. This is what my textbook says. I'm not, this isn't my opinion. This is fact. But some people deny fact. If you want a good book on this, um, The Merchants of Doubt. You can manufacture and sell doubt if you're really good. 
Michael Mann, I told you about his, his climate wars. Um, crazy. Uh, what has happened to his family as a, as a very sound scientist. And this confusion is at every level. I was eating this with my, my girlfriend. Um, and this vegan barbecue chicken wrap. I do eat meat. I'm not, I'm not an extremist by any means. Um, this says, I couldn't believe it. Um, the true cause of global warming is methane, not carbon dioxide. And they're trying to get people aware that cows, you're right, cows do release a lot of methane. But in compare, and they are a very potent greenhouse gas. But to size it up against the amount of carbon dioxide that we're emitting is, is foolish. I called the company and I said, hey, I want to help you market your product in a way that doesn't agitate scientists. And um, <laughs> anyway, I, I tried to be as friendly as I could. The guy was receptive for, for a while, and then I think he had it with me. But uh, I think that there's a point to be made here. You need to be enthousi enthusiastic about the solutions. You can't, I couldn't call him up and just be like, yo, but you did the wrong girl. You know, it, it's in the approach, and uh, you can't step on toes. And if you do step on toes, make sure you provide an ice pack. <laughs> This guy, another tactic used by big industry. This guy, according to the movie The Big Fix, was bought. One day he said the BP oil spill, no problem. The next day, guess what? He was receiving a $10 million, this is um, Ed uh, uh, Overton from Louisiana State University. He was receiving a $10 million research grant after the oil spill. After, on day one, he was saying, this is catastrophic, this is horrible. Two weeks later, the guy was on, on um, uh, what was it, uh, the nightly news, or not nightly news, but, um, and, no, what's the guy you watch at night on, uh, I know, uh, David Letterman, thank you, David Letterman, and uh, he was saying, yeah, it's a minuscule amount of oil, and microbes are just going to clean it up real quick. Well, we know what just happened to be the oil the other day, right? Okay, well, if you, if you can't buy a scientist, guess who you can buy? Um, you can help buy a politician and put them in office. These are 11, 111 proposed energy bills. Of those, only five passed. And all of these five that passed had provisions allocated to fossil fuel industries or nuclear energy. Well, if you can't buy a politician, you can't buy a scientist, well, let's just get rid of you. Now, I'm not much of a, a person who believes in all this, what do you call it, conspiracy theory. But if you've watched as many documentaries as I have on this issue, it's very hard to deny that they wouldn't use some radical tactics to put silence to the outspoken ones. This is the former governor of Louisiana, um, King Fisher, also known as Hugh Long. He was shot. This is Matthew Simpson. Matthew Simpson mysteriously drowned in his bathtub. This is Tom Ogle. He was mysteriously found in the desert. And Rudolf Diesel was found floating on a cruise ship where he was trying to promote peanut oil to run his diesel engine. Are these coincidences? There's so many of them. Are all of them coincidences? I don't know. Um, then, of course, the plastic. The plastic industry. They're my favorite. Uh, the plastic industry, um, they actually tried to change California curriculum, envi new environmental curriculum. They actually were able to, to put pro-plastic bag phrasing. Plastic bags are one of the nemesis of our environment. And they were able to change the text. But guess what? We gained some senses. Um, there was a whole bunch of us, uh, part of the Clean Seas Coalition. We revolted in unison. And the state listened. Uh, friend and Senator Fran Pavley, Senator Fran Pavley wrote letters. We got that pro-plastic bag you know, uh, rhetoric out of the textbook. Um, now my textbook, look at the phrasing we're using. The science was vehemently attacked by skeptics, many with ties to the fossil fuel industry. We are now in the age of the new scientist. The new scientist doesn't just do research and give it to you know, some people and say, hey, uh, you make the policies. Guess what we now have to do with it? We have to actually do the research and advocate and make sure the whiteout cans don't come out. And this is, our, 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 this, is the re this is my textbook, straight out of Castro and Hover, I have it in my backpack. Other feasible steps, meaning solutions, include reducing subsidies on fossil fuel use. We're not doing that, not even close. Developing and investing in cleaner alternative technologies for power generation and transport. 
We're not doing that. At least we're not doing it fast enough. We're starting, but we need to accelerate. This guy, also good news. Guess what? This Berkeley super genius uh, guy, his name is Richard uh, Mueller. He was a climate skeptic for years, a contrarian, a denial person. And he now just joined the IPCC group of scientists, 2,500 scientists, 98% of whom agree that climate change is happening and that our human emissions from burning fossil fuels is the main cause. We have to get on the same page about that. BP oil spill, another great thing the other day. They didn't pay enough, in my estimation, but at least it was something. They, they, had, they actually pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter. That's huge. And for covering up all these things, the safety uh, guidelines and stuff on the BP oil rig. New York Times. Plastic bag bans. Um, 50 municipalities have thus far uh, implemented or are pursuing a plastic bag ban in the state of California. And for almost I don't know what the statistic is, for, but for many of them, the plastic bag industry has uh, threatened a lawsuit against cities. And this took us, we, Santa Monica, we, our, our city council was all in support of this. It took us three years to ban uh, plastic bags because we had to do an environmental impact report. Finally, the California Supreme Court, um, uh, back in July 2011, said we didn't need that EIR report anymore. We can just, you know, cities can do it if they want it which is great. So another one for the environment. I'm not going to go into this, but it's politics. I mean, you know, I, I, I appreciate both sides. I listen. Um, but when I heard, you know, Mitt Romney during the election say, make fun of the fact that Obama had, had promised to reduce sea level rise and would try to help the environment, Obama then mockingly said, I'm not going to promise those things to you. I'm going to promise uh, to help you put, get back to work not realizing that putting you back to work is going to be putting you into a dream job of the future. Um, goals for education, though. So now we're going to some goals for education. I'm going to speed this up because I've got about 10-15 uh, minutes left of my talk. I know this is long, there's a lot of information, but um, I'm happy to talk to you guys um, about what do we need to do now. We need to do a lot of stuff. We need to boost, we need to boost environmental literacy, something that is in None of our schools, we don't have an environmental science class okay, at Samuel High, we don't have environmental sustainability. You know, now it's a major at colleges, that's a start. We're making progress, but there is no environmental literacy, unless you get some from your parents, or you take Mr. K's class. <laughs> um, critical thinking, uh, we need to boost critical thinking to overcome the deniers. We need to raise a generation of stewards that are aware of local and global issues and solutions, which I presented to you tonight. We need to teach students to care about nature. I mean, you should see how much trash there is after lunch at our school. There is nothing being done to avert that plastic uh, from the grass and, and the schoolyards. We need something, and nothing's being done. Give students skills to succeed in the green economy, affect positive change towards sustainability in schools and community. Good news, we've got EEI that just came out. Um, I told you, I've, I've talked about this, the environment uh, and the education initiative. New curriculum can be used by teachers across the state. Check. This group um, is a middle school in LA. They built the leading tower of styrofoam trays, as tall as a tree. Convinced LAUSD to stop using styrofoam plates. Pretty cool, huh? Great group of middle schoolers. Guest speakers, get guest speakers in. Learn from documentaries. A lot of people don't have time. I've watched each one of these documentaries about 10 times. I learn something new every time I watch a documentary. Get students reading. Community members, you read too. Look at the real research. Cross-reference the media, uh, newspapers that you get. Get students involved with real research. Get service learning part of the actual grade that they receive in the class. Yeah. That is something that I think every teacher in the United States and across the world should be doing. Service learning, going to events. Here's my events wall. 
Look at all these events coming up. You guys go. You don't get extra credit. It's part of your grade. You need to do five, and then when you're done, you write a reflection on it. These are practices that we could do if we had the political will and the teachers could calibrate about what's happening to the earth. Competitions. Uh, let's do competitions. If it takes a competition to get someone inspired to do something for the environment, let's do it. Then came Team Marine. This is what we started back in 2006, 2007. This is what we do. We go to conferences to eco-educate ourselves because you have to know what's going on with the planet before you can eco-activate. So eco-educate to eco-activate. This applies to everyone in this room. Going to conferences, watching movies together, being filled by CNN, that's a bonus. Um, <laughs> taps, uh, watching about plastic water bottles. Beach and wet wetlands restorations. Cleaning the earth, getting students involved with their community. This is you guys. This year. Now, some people think beach cleanups don't do anything. I choose to differ. Before, I had my team marine students doing an emergency beach cleanup in 2010, uh, first flush. Bam, after, kapoo, booye. We did it. Before, this is right at Pico, Santa Monica, after. Um, <laughs> This is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> removing invasive plant species from the vinyl wetlands, recycling on all levels. Mm -hmm. But what we don't have in our school district, and, and uh, this is not just our school district, but many school districts, is a comprehensive recycling program that's coordinated among all the different schools. We need that. And it's hard to bring up this dialogue because I, I don't want to step on toes, but it's something we desperately need to do. We need to do all this stuff. Electronic recycling. I have a program that we've been doing for a long time. We raise recycling goods. Then we cash them in to get money to get these water purifiers. We send them to Africa, Cambodia, uh, uh, and South America, all sorts of places. It's a day of recycling. We've now done over 100,000 containers of recycling. Five cents a piece. Our life straw costs um, $5.50. So it's 110 cans of bottles. We'll get you one water purifying life straw save somebody's life and the planet at the same time. Recycling in the rain. Recycling at the Rose Parade. Hosting environmental events at our school. Earth Day. Collecting plastic pollution and plastic from our households. Bringing them into the classroom. Counting them, enumerating them. Then doing eco artwork with them that raises awareness. These, have been, these pictures have been viewed by thousands and thousands of people. Third Street Promenade, 111 pounds of plastic on our local beach, front page of the newspaper. Bam. Going to City Hall, <laughs> teaching students to you know, share what they feel with the people who make the decisions for our community. Doing creative artwork with cigarette butts. It's banned in our city, but guess what? Sure are a lot of cigarette butts down there. Is there enforcement? It leaves a bit to be desired, but um, stop smoking. My mom did. You can do. <laughs> uh, building vehicles. Um, we have uh, we've helped build junk. Fifteen thousand plastic water bottles have floated on from Long Beach to Hawaii. Marcus Erickson um, from Five Jars came to my classroom to build a pontoon holder. We watched it launch uh, on this very special day and weaved emergency rope out of plastic bags. We built lighter boards, lighter paddle boards. These lighters came from the um, the carcasses of Blazon albatross from Midway Atoll. These straws came from the beach and from our schools and our cupboards. <laughs> I got the maiden voyage in this one. A plastic raft made out of 8,000 straws. Solar cup, electrical and mechanical engineering, giving the students the hands-on, you know, real world, go for the green economy jobs. Fun. We just got a, a red, three years ago, we got um, Mimi uh, Poon and, and Russell Fear. they donated this red car to Team Marine. Since then we've gotten um, in the neighborhood of a lot of money uh, from these organizations right here uh, to help us buy lithium ion iron phosphate batteries to do an all electric car conversion. It's pretty cool. We're almost done. Time for CNN. Why do we use the media? 
to, to bring, hey, green spotlight, oh, look at me, look at me. No, it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> the media comes, guess who learns about it? The world. Yeah? So that's why we like media. Leverage the media, get what you want. Uh, doing real research, there's so much good stuff here. I'd love to talk about this. Grocery store research, the students have been, uh, I was going to have you e talk, but I, I, I'm long winded, so I'm uh, short of breath. So. The students have been looking at 60,000 people coming out of Santa Monica grocery stores, looking at their age, their gender, their um, and plastic, you know, what, what kind of bag that they were doing. They did this a year before the ban, and they've now done it a year after the ban. Pretty cool, huh? They're presenting to the city of Santa Monica in February, if you want to come see that. Uh, water quality research, direct teaching. Look at this kid. I love it. Anytime I see this picture, you just make me smile. <laughs> Lobbying governments and, uh, sorry Ben, uh, we've got to lobby school boards too. We've got to, we've got to get in there and, and, and tell people, listen, we need to make some moves, okay? Uh, and we need to do them quickly. And if we keep waiting and stalling and worry about toes that we're going to step on, we're not going to get enough done quick enough to save this planet. Going up to uh, Sacramento, lobbying, going to, going to Washington, D.C. and lobbying. Telling people you need a voice. When the leaders lead, sorry, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. <laughs> my favorite quotes. When I'm awake. Uh, she's been really wonderful. This is Julia Browning, one of our assembly women. Um, she helped, she's been trying to get plastic back then for several years. Uh, we helped, uh, you know, uh, put forth some ideas for a sustainability policy for our district. The students wrote this. It's fantastic. Marches. Um, marches are awesome. Uh, booyah. Yeah, we've done a lot of these now, and, and finally we were heard. And, uh, students help not just in a small way, you guys, but in a big way. And they have the right to free speech, too. Uh, multimedia, uh, social networking, uh, using the tools to resonate the message. Let's save this planet, guys. we got to do it. YouTube videos. I don't know how many tens of thousands of views we have on 42 videos or something else. Eco-propaganda, be proud of your organization. Support the organic teas. Um, write letters and petitions to everyone uh, that you can, board members. Write petitions uh, to uh, local assembly people and senators. The president, we wrote Obama. Paddle outs. Press releases, we write press releases, really good. Spread the message, spread awareness. Roadmap and party thoughts. I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> so, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. These are what I consider pretty critical things that we need to do in education. Education is the only thing that's going to get us the critical mass, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to getting out of these, uh, out of these environmental woes. We need a critical mass so that we can beat the Goliath of big industry. Okay? We need a critical mass to, con to convince administrators and school boards that we need more recycling bins, that we need gardens, that we need healthier cleaning chemicals in schools. Guess what the good news is? I'm proud. Our district has done a really good job. We, we got rid of all the nasty cleaning chemicals a couple years ago, put new cleaning chemicals in. We're retrofitting our schools with solar. Nine of our schools, uh, from my understanding, are, are being outfitted with solar panels to help go grid neutral. Um, we now have, uh, thanks to Ben and the other board members, we, we have the hope of meeting with, uh, getting a sustainability committee together to actually with all stakeholders to get um, some really great work done as a, as a team. Um, at, but no meeting has been tabled yet that I'm aware of. Uh, so we need to move a little quicker than we are right now. Passionate teachers, this is my roadmap, some advice perhaps. Uh, passionate teachers and students work internally on grassroots projects for zero waste and grid neutrality. That's happening at SMUSD. We just need to go a little faster. Guess what's really good about the other school I work at, SMC? They're already, they're setting the trends. They're a, a nationally recognized green school. They have green buildings. They are actually uh, generating tons and tons of power for several of their buildings. It's really inspiring. Go take an Eco Campus tour uh, over at SMC. It's, it's fantastic. That's what our SMN USD schools need to get to and aspire to. Uh, I just got done with one last week with some of my colleagues at the, at the college. Get, I love this one, get school board on board 
for top-down support. We need we need a person at the district, and, and Ben, this is my opinion. We need someone who's officially working um, as a sustainability officer and coordinator. We can't have one person trying to do everything. And right now, I think the one person who is working on all these efforts, she's fantastic. She's made tons of progress, but she needs help. Uh, we need a sustainability committee with all stakeholders involved, teachers, students, parents. We need sustainability in the mission statement of the school, right? So that administrators and teachers know that this is something we need to impart to graduating cohorts of students. Yeah. Sustain, um, pursue architectural retrofits, which we're doing, green practices products. Uh, number three, enlist help of the PTAs. PTAs are strong. Administrators listen to the principals, listen to, to um, PTA members and, and also just parents. Even community members, call up your local school, wherever you live. Just be like, I wanted to know what you're doing. Environmentally sound practices, behaviors, what is it? Um, apply some pressure, gently. If you step on toes accidentally, again, ice pack. <laughs> Role model behaviors, um, coordinate tasks. Teachers, especially in the science, um, integrate, this is called environmental service learning, outreach, and research in, uh, in the curriculum. And get students performing school audits. They just did a school audit of our water fountain. And our water fountains, we found in our school, we did this two, about two years ago, we did it again. We just finished the data. We're about to send it to the board and, and administrators at school. 80% uh, of our water fountains at our school site are either dysfunctional or not working. And then there's cleanliness issues with them. That means only 20% of the water fountains are working properly. If you don't only have 20% working properly, that's going to encourage you to buy what? Plastic water bottles, right? Which exacerbates the plastic pollution problem. Especially as a lot of young teenagers, unfortunately, you guys know better than I do, not everybody throws away their trash um, properly, right? Of course, there's this optional thing to integrate the EEI, this environmental curriculum, but guess how many high school teachers at our school have done, have done it? Zero. We need to mandate these things. We need to incentivize these things in a profound way. And, um, and this is important. Get administrators to set up professional development opportunities. I've been at Samuel High for, this is my seventh year. I love Samuel High. I've, my, my career started there for the most part. Um, I've seen, uh, I've been to professional development on, on autism, Asperger's syndrome, homophobia, bullying. I've never been to one professional development, school-wide or district-wide uh, opportunity uh, that's based on the environment and what's happening with the planet. Now other districts, guess what? They do it monthly, monthly. Yeah, that's something we need to do, desperately. My parting thoughts, be an agent of change. Don't wait for the agents of change to change you, one. Number two, to not have discussions in the classroom and with your children, if you're a parent, about politics and environmental assaults by big polluters teaches kids to accept the status quo. The status quo, is leading us to zero to problems with our fisheries, problems with climate change. We're going to be off this planet uh, pretty quickly if we don't act. Next, please share with me a sense of urgency. I think you guys can all see it. I'm sincere with my message here. Please share a sense of urgency in moving to this better place that doesn't have to, you know, kill our walls. Um, it's it's an eco-friendly world. Um, and do what is ethically correct. Students, teachers, parents, and community members can have a huge impact from the bottom up and top down, so time to speak up. Do it in a friendly way. Show your enthusiasm for these sort of things. Don't run around with a rusty pitchfork and stab people because they don't drive an electric car, or they went to Starbucks and they got another paper cup with a plastic lid. We can all do better, and that's what this whole message is really about. There's a lot of pros to this, which include increasing uh, test scores for, for, um, at schools. It's a huge part. Principals, guess what? Principals and school boards, they tend to focus on one thing. Let's improve test scores. Guess what 
a green year school does for test scores. Jumps in AP score, API scores and CST scores by 10s, 20s, 30s. These are what the other schools are reporting all around us. We need to do this. Now the cons of what I do, I think you guys can tell I'm tired, I'm worn down. I've done a lot. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> Thank you for attending.